I will then at this point in time say to Jeremy Brickhill, Abantu Ababa Kelelap, Balintele, Utu Ubachel, Uti, look out to us on chair. Thank you. And English is not our mother tongue, and we should not be embarrassed. So, Mike, Thank you. And greetings to all of you. Uh, <clears throat> I was asked to speak on the subject of peace and justice. Uh, the pillars of human rights. But I'm not a human rights lawyer. I'm a freedom fighter. So I've chosen to speak as a freedom fighter. So I think this would have made sense to Comrade Lokat Masuku. But before I address the subject, I think I have to explain myself a little bit and explain why I call myself a freedom fighter. I grew up in Rhodesia. I see these some young people here and I'm wondering how I can explain to them what was Rhodesia. I lived in an all-white suburb. I went to school only with white children. Actually, I went to reps in the Matopo. Reps, Matopo, if I got that right. Yes. And later I went to school in Sosbe, in the Rhodesia of that time. I never met a single black kid. I never played sport with a black or even a colored even uh, Indian. We lived, I'm telling you, in our white prison. While Gogo lived in the black prison. And I don't know how to explain this to young people. When I left school, I was expected to go to the Rhodesian army and fight for white supremacy. And Ian Smith told us they will never have majority rule, never in a thousand years. And he also told us that the Beatles were communists. You know the music group, the Beatles? He told us they were communists. Because Do you remember, some of you remember him, 
And the Beatles music was banned on Rhodesian Broadcasting Corporation. Because John Lennon sang some songs about peace. Because John Lennon, one of the Beatles, he sang some songs about peace. One of the persons who are going to be able to do it, he said, Apparently, it was these communists also who were telling black people that they must fight. Because they were oppressed. They didn't know they were oppressed. They need, you needed communists to tell you you were oppressed. <laughs> That was how we grew up. But I was very fortunate. My mother was different from white people that I knew. She was not a political person. But she was a human a humanitarian person. She was different from all other whites I knew at that time. About. When I grew up, I never met a white person who supported the liberation struggle. There were such people Judy Todd, Reg Austin, many of them. But, but by then they had been put in prison or they had left the country. And I had no contact with black people. Because we were in our white school and our white prison. And everybody seemed to support Smith or White Rope. Everybody. But in my home, my mother would not allow racist attitudes or opinions. When my school friends, my white school friends, came to my house to play, if they made a mistake and they called a black man a boy, or a kefa. I think there was a kefa My mother would clap them. And then my friends went to their parents and said, That mother is a kefa lover. So my friends were being chased away from my house by my mother. So I'm ashamed to say that when I was small, I wished my mother would shut up. She's chasing my friends. I only want to play football. But today I know how much I owe my mother. So, when the time came for me to leave school, I was collected to the Rhodesian Army. So, no question. But already I knew from my mother that I could not fight for this thing. 
Maybe I should run away. Like many young whites, they ran away. So many but because my mother had taught us to question, I, I wanted to understand what were the, what was the nationalism we were fighting for. What was the liberation movement? What was Zapu? What was Zapu? But, but it was very difficult. The leaders were detained, were exiled, books were banned. I couldn't find this information. And then the coup in Portugal took place in April 1974. And the Portuguese army started to withdraw from Mozambique. The interim Frelimo government came in in June 1974. I don't know why, but I decided, right, I'm going. So I crossed the border to Mozambique. And I went to look for Frelimo. When I was there, I saw the arrival of the Frelimo guerrillas from the north. Taking power. Singing, the people welcoming. I listened to the stories being told. I saw that in Frelimo there were some whites, there were coloreds, there were Africans, there were people of all colors in Frelimo. Then I said, ah, now I know what liberation is. I want it. Now I tell you a story. So I stayed with Frelima. I told them I want to join the liberation struggle in Zimbabwe. Where should I go? I've heard that there's Zapu, I've heard that there's Zanu. What, where do I go? Frelimo told me, be careful. Don't go to, don't go to Zanu, they are very backward. They will kill you. They don't understand the politics. They are small boys fighting each other. <laughs> the only place you can go is Zapu. They are mature politically. I joined Zapu because Zapu offered a vision of the kind of Zimbabwe I believe in. Inclusive for all people of Zimbabwe. Not racist, not tribalist. Justice for all people. So I volunteered to serve in Zipra. So Very strangely, and it was a shock to me. 
it was a great shock to me, but I was taken somewhere and told to sit down. Okay. And Umdala walked in. Joshua Nkomo, President. Okay, but Joshua Nkomo was a figure. I didn't know what to say. I, the President is here. Uh, yes, I said, I said, I was thinking, I said, 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 I I said, okay, I have to tell him the truth. Um, I want to join the Liberation Army and fight to free Zimbabwe. He said, you are too young. What I said, I'm not too young. He said, let us send you to university. I said, I don't want to go to school. I want to fight. He, he had no more excuses. So he said to me, I'm not sure our soldiers will understand you. Because we don't have another one like you. I said, you mean this? He was not comfortable. He said, look at that. Yes. I said to him, if I have understood Zabu, we are building a new Zimbabwe. If we are building a new Zimbabwe, we have to start during the struggle. I that means you cannot refuse me to join Zipra. He said, yeah, all right, okay. So I was taken to Dabengo, actually. And I was deployed into the National Security Organization, NSA, of Zipra. And I served in the intelligence directorate under Victor Blambo. That's why it's called the Zimbabwe People's Revolutionary Army. We were fighting against a system to free our people, all of them. Sometimes people ask me why I joined an Indebeli army. That's also not true. I joined the People's Army. I served with Zimbabweans from every corner of this country. We were all Zimbabweans, whether we were the Kurus or Asians or Black or this or that. We never had a tribe or identity, racial identity. 
Was I effective in my operations? Was I disciplined? Was I part of the liberation struggle in my heart? No comrade ever asked me how I am being a white. But they all, we all asked each other, Comrade, are you okay? We were comrades. So I used to have a joke with Dr. Nkhol. After the first time he met me and we had the discussion about whether I can be safe in the army. So I saw him a few times during the war, not often. And when I saw him, he said, ah, are you okay? eaten you yet? <laughs> I used to reply to him, no, Comrade President, we are Puzaring Smith together. <laughs> and then I used to say to him, Comrade will know this song. Zipura, Zipura, Shumba, Smithy, Nyama, Ay, 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 Mengos. Eh, Sasta will let it go. Abai, Abai, Az, Oba, Bumo. Mdala used to laugh at me and say, Okay, you are right, go. Abi, Sita, Ay, Uga, Ashe, Suna, Skabe. That's the army I joined. And that's the experience I had to remember. That is the Zimbabwe I was fighting to achieve. I think. That is the army I was fighting to achieve. That is the army that was commanded by the late hero Lukaku Masuku, who we are commemorating today. I want to say a few words about the late Lukaku Masuku. I did not know Comrade Masuku well before independence. I was deployed in my own unit with my own commanders. We couldn't just go and talk to any commander. Because we were very disciplined. Sometimes some comrades say we were too disciplined. But I knew about Lukaku Masuku and I knew he was very much respected in the whole army. When I got to know Comrade Lukat, it was after the arrest of the Zipu commanders. During the so-called treason trial. 
prison trial. So called. So called. So Gemba, we do not go to a prison trial. Uh, we 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 take to I think it's a politics. This was after independence. Was it Gemba? Was Busa? 1980. Yeah, 81. It was a very difficult time for all of us. It was a very difficult time for our leaders, members, and supporters. What's that? It was a very difficult time for our leaders, members, and supporters. What's that? It was a very difficult I was involved in the legal defense as the political and that is where I first discovered Comrade Masuku's qualities as a commander. A strategic man. A very thoughtful man. Patient. Patient. And absolutely determined. And the wise Later, when he became very ill, he was transferred to Paranyatra Hospital. What is of Pabilin is a good up, was a teacher of Paranyan or Espedia, yes, it was me. That was in, on 11th March 1986. As soon as I discovered he was in the hospital, I made my way to the hospital and found my way to get to him. I spent most of the next three weeks with him in the hospital. I came to know him at that time not as a commander, but as a courageous and dignified human being. A long he knew that his illness was fatal. And he faced his death with defiance and bravery. But above all, he was a compassionate man. He was concerned not about himself, but about others. I've visited him almost every day in hospital. And I carried out many of his final wishes. There were three main issues that he was concerned about in those last few days. His own family. His bigger family, the soldiers of Zipra. And the history of the Liberation War. It was his concern for the fighters and the families of the fighters that we were often discussing. He wanted the fallen fighters to be remembered. He wanted the graves to be located. He wanted shrines to be established so that young people would know their history. And he wanted the families of the fallen fighters to be given this information. Because he knew that 
He gave me clear instructions on all these issues. And they led to the establishment of the Zaku War Shrines Committee. Committee. And eventually the creation of the Mafela Trust. I say congratulations to the comrades from the Mafela Trust today. It's you have carried out his last wishes. The Umlando more must be done on the history. Our simple history has been suppressed and falsified for too long. My congratulations to the organizers today because this is part of bringing that history out of the suppression. One small aspect of this history which I want to comment on today and that is the role of Zipra in contributing to the armed struggle in South Africa. Everyone knows we had an alliance between Zipra and the Mkonto with Israel. Most people think that alliance stopped in 1980. I'm very pleased that Comrade De Begwa last week revealed at a conference of in South Africa. He finally revealed that we maintained that alliance after 1980. We did that secretly. Zanu tried to prevent Amkonto from operating from here. They were assisted by the Rhodesians and the apartheid agents at the West. The MK was alone. And as Dabengwa revealed last week in South Africa, members of Zipra enabled Okonto to continue the armed struggle. Even, even while we were being attacked here by our own government. This should be recognized in our history. I can recognize some people here who I think were involved in this. But I'm not going to identify them. I'm going to identify myself. Today, after Dabekwa's revelation of information in South Africa, I want to admit and confess that I was one of the Zipra officers who carried out the orders of the late commanders, including Masuku, and I assisted Abkonta. I've kept it secret for 35 years. Others here can also confess in their own time. 
Because we should be proud of what we did. So, I've used all my time without talking about justice and peace. I have to say that 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 I have all right. So, I've been talking about justice and peace for the last half an hour. I have been talking about justice and peace. Yes, I've been talking about justice and peace. As a freedom fighter, I went to fight for justice and peace. But I've learned that there can be no peace without justice. And I mean justice in the broadest sense. Social, economic, political justice. So today in Zimbabwe, I am disappointed. In the struggle days, yes, can you say, we talked about transforming our society. We talked about building a new Zimbabwe in which there would be social, economic, and political justice. We talked about eradicating poverty. Educating all our children. We talked about freedom. We talked about fighting for independence. We might say we have achieved our independence. But what kind of independence is this? Yes. We are begging for aid from the imperialists who enslaved this country in the first place. Is that a proud and free people? No. We are selling the resources which belong to our children and our grandchildren. To pay for our small houses today. What kind of independence is that? So, so, oh, oh. <laughs> Sorry for that. Okay. Uh, oh, good is bad, Dale. This one was mean. Oh, oh, my, oh, my, oh, oh. I'm at the touch. You go. Oh, my, oh, my, oh, my, oh, my. Okay. We might say we have achieved a freedom from racial oppression. Singati says, Tony, they. But what have we replaced it with? In Zimbabwe today, there are many forms of discrimination, exclusion, marginalization, and next to them, is the privilege for the new elite. The skin color has changed. But what has changed for the people? 
And for me, the key pillar of the question of our rights is the fair share to the economic resources in the country. If you cannot feed your family, you are not free. I'm not going to talk about the dreadful state of hospitals, schools, and so on. No fuel, no food. You all know this. I can tell you this is not the Zimbabwe we dreamed of and we fought for. So the real question is what are we doing about this? And I want to speak from the heart. And I'm speaking especially to the young generation. During the liberation struggle, we had our own contradictions among ourselves as comrades. We had difficulties and we had differences. But we managed them with discipline in the interests of collectively pursuing the struggle. What are we doing today in Zimbabwe? We are quarreling among ourselves, yeah. blaming each other, blaming Zanu, blaming G40, blaming sanctions, beating each other, arresting Paul Gatti, NGOs, shooting demonstrators in the streets. What is this? What is this? And while we are doing it, the new elite are lining their pockets. Our national resources are being plundered by the international capitalists. And our people are living in poverty. This road is the road to conflict and war. A hungry man is an angry man. And a hungry woman is a dangerous sister. If we want peace in this country, we have to establish justice for our people. Social, economic, and political justice. And if we are, want to establish, achieve justice, we have to transform our society and our state. As a society, as a community, we have to transform ourselves to, to become effective. If we are effective, we can transform the state and the country. If we are confused and fighting among ourselves, we will not transform anything. President Munangagwa has told us that we are at a crossroads. I 
I agree with him. We are at a crossroads. We have to decide which direction we are going to go. Our liberation was achieved through a national effort by all of the people of Zimbabwe. We all played a part. Not just fighters, mothers, sisters, underground activists. No, no one person, including Robert Mugabe, liberated this country. No one party liberated this country. The people liberated this country. The transformation we need today, the new dispensation that the President Munakawa talks about, will not be achieved by one President, one political party, one politburo, it will be only achieved by all the people. This is the challenge I believe Comrade Rukhara Masungu answered when he joined the liberation struggle. I think it's the challenge we face today. Starting in our own communities. We have differences. This one is ABCD, this one is ABCA, this one is ABCA, this one is ABCD. Shame. Who take with that? We have to find each other. We have to stop blaming each other, including blaming Zanu. I don't blame Zanu. We must blame ourselves. We are the only ones who can free ourselves. We definitely cannot continue to live like this. And we cannot leave this for our kids. But our time is nearly over, Jack. You and me, we are getting older. We need to 